Hello everyone, I'm Joel Baird, the General Manager of Missoula Community Access Television, inviting you to this, our second episode of our fourth season of <laughs> Missoula Live. And I'm Kim Anderson, I'm on the board of MCAT, and I'm also the Associate Director of Humanities Montana. And we have a, a leisurely lineup of guests for you this very afternoon, and I have just a few MCAT things to share with you. The um, leading thing is uh, the yeah. Do It in 72 contest. This is the, the fourth year that we've offered the 72-hour film contest. So one of the ideas of making uh, the, the entrance do the films only in three days is that they get done. Right. There's one way to make a movie is you got to do it. Um, because or otherwise be you start feeling like you're Bergman yeah. and then it goes on forever <laughs> and you're creating yeah. in your head and nothing happens. And people, if you're interested in, in the contest, you can prepare for the contest. You can rehearse performers. Mm -hmm. You can um, look out locations. You can compose music that's going to be in the background. It's all okay. What you have to do is shoot and edit within 72 hours. And to make everyone honest in this um, respect, we are asking participants to come to MCAT on that very Friday, October the 9th. Mm -hmm. They come here at 5 p.m. and we'll tell them three things that have to be in the yeah. movie. Last year, one of those three things was some character had to say, awesome sauce. That's right. And it actually turned out to be this incredible inspiration for, for three movies yes. called Awesome, awesome Sauce. Awesome Sauce is now a And thing. that one, Kyle and Austin and the rest of them did, that right. was pretty amazing. And then the two others were amazing, too. So in order to find out these three things, you'll only know in the 72nd hour, which was the first countdown, to Monday, October 12th, where you have to send us a link or physically bring in this movie to MCAT by 5 p.m. Now, the winner gets $500. The second place is $300, and the honorable mention is so $100. Good prizes. Yeah, cash money, people. Right. So for more information, look at MCAT.org. Uh, Scott had just shown you. There's really not that much information there yet, but there will be. <laughs> There'll just be the rules. But right. otherwise, it's pretty simple. You have to come here, you get three things, you run off and make the movie, you win $500. Oh, the screening will be at the oh, Roxy, right. 718 South Higgins, on Saturday, October 25th, 7 p.m. The screening is free, entering is free. And then are the winners announced at that event? Only at that event, right? At the right? screening, right. Yeah, so people, and you got to go, you got to be yeah. there. If you're not oh. there and you win, uh, you don't. <laughs> Well, because, you know, people need to support one another's Absolutely. efforts. Absolutely. They're just I like, know. I'm too cool for school. I made the movie. Oh, did it win? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be <laughs> down there. It's not going to work that way. Text yeah. me, yeah. Right. So that's, that's pretty much what I have, except to say to the average citizen, if you're interested in MCAT on the second Wednesday of every month, 5.30 p.m. right here, 500 North Higgins, you can come to our little tour and training. Yes. That's also free. Well, there's lots going on with Humanities Montana. Mm. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the programs that we've been supporting for years and years just announced their deadlines, and there's our website. Um, letters about literature. If you are, if you have children, if you are a teacher, if you are a librarian, uh, then there's a great national contest that we support at Humanities Montana and the Montana Center for the Book called Letters for Literature, where uh, young people from grades 4 through 12 are invited to write a letter to an author whose work has had a an effect on them. Oh, that's has really meant sweet. something to them. Yeah. And so it's not uh, a book report. Mm -mm. It's not a paper. It's a personal letter to an author, you know, and you get wonderful, you know, kids writing to, you know, dear Dr. Seuss. Sure. Or dear it's four through twelve. Yes, and there there are different category, uh, different age categories within that. Um, local prizes, statewide prizes are, I think the, the winning high school letter in Montana gets $200. Okay. Um, younger children, I think the winning four through six is uh, $100. And then the, the state one, two, three 
uh, letters in each age category go on to a national level. And then you're talking big bucks. Oh, wow. That's so, really great. And Montana, over the years, has had, I think, four or five honorable mentions at the national okay. le level. So uh, it's certainly doable. Uh, there's the, the page on our website, and you can find out the deadlines and how to participate. Uh, and But the deadlines are coming up in December and January, so you have some time to, oh, yeah. to talk to your children about and it. There's and there's a word limit. It's not like they need to write a 20-page letter to No, most Edgerly of these Masters. letters are one page long, or, right. you know, and they're, they're adorable. Yeah. So there is that. Um, also, we are, uh, as of October 1st, so this is just a little advance notice, putting out a call for new speakers and new programs for our Montana Conversations program. That's um, great. We have presenters who are experts in humanities topics all over the state, and that includes uh, presentations about history, about literature, philosophy, uh, jurisprudence, current events, um, Native American cultures and histories. And so if you have an expertise in any of those areas, and you have an interest in traveling around the state and sharing your knowledge and talking to people about the topic that fascinates you, then I hope you will apply to be on our Speakers Bureau. And we pay an honorarium, we pay all your travel expenses, and uh, it's a great way to see the state and, yeah. and get to know other people who are interested in what you're interested in. So again, the information about how to become a speaker is uh, will be on our website. We'll be accepting applications through, I believe, December 15th. And uh, all of the information will be on the website beginning this, the end of this week. Excellent. And I, I would um, concur. You know, one of the things Humanity of Montana does is fun conversation, right? Yes. And who doesn't like to talk? Well, so <laughs> Clearly so, we do. But we do. <laughs> and I know there are a lot of people out there watching the program that may be just too um, humble for their own good. Yeah. That they have knowledge. You know, it could be that you've done deep reading on a certain subject, right? right? right. You don't have to hold a degree. No, we talk about uh, uh, certainly humanities scholars can be someone with an advanced degree. It can be a tribal elder. It can be someone who has, uh, through life experience, mm -hmm. amassed you know expertise in an area. So uh, there's there's all sorts of experts out there in the world, and we want you. Excellent. All right, we better get on to our guests, so unless you have more. Us. Have no. you more? Enough about us. All right. Um, Jessie Rogers is here. She's representing hey. the Historical hey. Museum of Fort Missoula. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's congratulations on the new job. I know. Yeah. I love it. It's a wonderful place to work, and it's just such an amazing 32-acre park, not just the museum, to just go out and walk around and see the vital Missoula history. It's really awesome. Oh, Absolutely yeah. Great. What a great location, especially this time of year. Oh, it's beautiful the... just to go out there and open and close the buildings yeah. and take a stroll. It is gorgeous out there, and I definitely want the community to know it's one peaceful place to walk your dog, hang out with your kids, take some pictures. Yeah. yeah that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Well, you're here specifically to talk about events, and yes. one in particular yes. is coming up soon. We are really excited to bring the Missoula community an alien place. It's a documentary which, through the help of Greater Montana Foundation, National Park Service, Montana Office of Tourism, and a lot of supporters out there, we were able to create a documentary about the World War II Alien Detention Center internment era that is specific to Missoula. We were a Department of Justice camp where we held over 2,000 interned Italians, Japanese Americans, um, and 23 Germans. So we had a large populace out there who were interned during the World War II era. And it is a phenomenal documentary. It is very well done. We have uh, used a lot of local historians and national historians. And so we are debuting this to the public for the first time. It's going to be at the Roxy Theater on October 7th. It's going to be um, very interesting as we will have four guest speakers there. Oh, great. So at 7.30, the doors open. People can come in, get their tickets there, buy them online, or even swing out to the museum. Mm -hmm. The speakers are going to be phenomenal. We'll be showing the film, and then after the film, we'll have a Q&A. So it's going to be interactive with the audience, which we're really excited about, just to hear the types of questions that this documentary creates in the audience is going to sure. be interesting. 
Um, the four speakers will be Kim Hogberg, who is one of the producers of the actual film. Then we have Diane Sands, who is an amazing historian in this area. Carol Van Balkenberg, who literally wrote the book. And oh, Alien Alien Alien. Alien. Yeah. Carol. <laughs> and uh, Elektra Vandenberg, mm -hmm. who is the daughter of Alfred Cipollato, the gentleman who owned the Italian grocer down on Broadway. Broadway Market. So yeah. I know, right? And uh, he was actually interned here before he married into the community and stayed afterwards. So just an eclectic mix of amazing people, and this documentary is really going to be fun. We, like I said, have the debut and the premiere on October 7th, which is Wednesday, and it's at 7.30. But we also wanted to make sure for those folks that are working late or just can't make it out in the evening, we're offering a matinee. So the nice. matinee is that following Sunday on the 11th at 4. There won't be any speakers then, but it's still going to be, you know, an amazing showing. And we reduced the ticket prices to just a flat $5. Kids 14 and under get in free, so you can bring your family, and it's not a, you know, big chunk out of your pocketbook. But those proceeds do go to fund the Friends of the Historical Museum. So sure. it's for a good cause, and it's going to be amazing. I do think we have a clip here that we're going to That's show. That's right. Oh, that would I said be great. Well, we had a little time, so mm. yeah, if Scott is prepared, he could show a short <laughs> clip One from the movie An Alien. One Montana Town played a pivotal role. One of the first uh, lists that we found was a list of almost a thousand of the Italian seamen who were brought here. He said they, they looked and they saw the beautiful mountain and the sun and the clouds and Oh, que bella vista, which is what a beautiful, beautiful view. Over 2,000 Italians and American Japanese were detained during the war, and their stories were for decades untold and cast in the shadows of American history. The reaction of Americans and human beings when they are faced with threat is frequently one that we are somewhat ashamed of. <laughs> All right, we're back. <laughs> that looks amazing. How long is the film? It's t approximately 30 minutes. So it's Perfect. not really long, but it packs mm. a lot in there. And, and is, will it, after these showings, and I think the best way to see it is clearly to, to be in a theater and to listen to people talk about mm -hmm. it who have been involved in it. Um, but after that, well, is it available for classrooms? For Yes, actually, we would uh, long-term hope is to be able to take this statewide and to yeah. bring it into classrooms, do some more educational speeches and, and preview it throughout the state. But also, you know, it will be available for sale. We have copies Great. of the DVD. The book and the DVD will be available for sale at the Roxy. It's also going to be for sale at the Historical Museum. And if you want to order it online, you can go online to our gift shop. So we're definitely trying to make it available to the public. Uh, we have a lot of future plans for it to be used in an educational purpose because that's really our goal out mm -hmm. at the Historical Museum is to help educate and, and interpret this time of our history for the nation as a whole. So we've got a lot of plans out there and this is just one piece of the pie and there's a lot of exciting changes going on at the fort and a lot of future projects that are coming down the pike that are going to be quite fabulous um, and just amazing interpretation of this history. So lots of fun things out there. Yeah, new personnel. You know, um, Dr. Bob Brown yes. retired, retired, right? Mm -hmm. So you right. have a new executive director. Yes, Matt, he's a great executive director. Right. A lot of vitality, a lot of mm -hmm. really good movement and energy out there. And, and they got Jesse here as development yeah. director. <laughs> yeah. She's full of vim and vigor. But I think we were talking before the show started, you know, this is a part of our history mm -hmm. that um, uh, until recently, people haven't known about and we haven't talked about it It really a lot. has been an unspoken part of our history, almost a hidden part, mm -hmm. you know. People, those who either lived through it on either side of the spectrum, you know, they didn't really want to voice it. And that is something that Elytra really brings to life. And, and when she speaks of her history, you know, you really do kind of get goosebumps because yeah. hearing it on an actual individual level who had lived through it via her father and how that impacted uh, their life as a whole for decades afterwards, it was really interesting. But I think it's really being brought to the table more, like we're saying, just um, you can turn on the TV and see shows occasionally that are using it as a backdrop mm -hmm. for their plot. And just having that 
bringing it to life, letting people see this part of our history. It's, it's quite interesting, and that's why we're excited to bring this to the community, because if you go out there on a hole and you ask anyone, they kind of go, we did? There was a, f a fort or an mm -hmm. internment camp? I didn't know that. You Isn't know? that and funny? Yeah. It really is. Well, and George Takei, you know, who was... Um, uh, Oh. Sol Sulu, Sulu on, on Star Trek, right. very famous, and mm -hmm. then became a strong gay rights advocate. Mm -hmm. His parents were interred, not right. here, but in Idaho, mm -hmm. and now there's a Broadway musical, Broadway musical oh. about that, mm -hmm. that element. But I think a lot of Americans would be very surprised to know that, that other American citizens mm -hmm. were yeah. removed from their homes and put in internment camps, it's mm -hmm. always that word camp in it. Uh, for the duration of the war, yeah, and a lot really of them were financially ruined yeah. because mm -hmm. of it. And I can remember if you and I were discussing it, that you know one of the defenses the uh, the government used in terms of Japanese Americans during World War II is they only removed those Japanese Americans close enough to the coast to do mm -hmm. mischief. Right. So that was mm -hmm. actually a thought that up and down California, mm -hmm. Oregon, and Washington coast, those people of Japanese American heritage were moved inland in case they would signal or mm -hmm. do something else mm -hmm. and so on. No, it's a fascinating history, especially in the fact that it is still alive. You know, history isn't something that's static. It's happening right now, and the descendants of a lot of these internees and those who were maybe born in a WRA mm -hmm. camp or lived their teenage single-digit years in these camps, you know, it's still very alive and real for a lot of the population out there. And I think bringing it to life and, and showing it and explaining just how horrible this was for a lot of people for a long time and still is. I mean, they still live with it every day. It's an education for Americans to remember what has happened and to learn from it so that hopefully, maybe, we learn from our past and don't do things like that again. And on a global scale, I think it's very important, too, because if you look around the world, it's happening out there today. So, right. you know, bringing the awareness of this and the impacts of it decades later, hopefully, will help oh, our yeah. future. Yeah. Well, congratulations on, I know the film has been a long time in the making, yes. and it's going to be fun to celebrate its completion. And uh, give us the dates again. Yep. The premiere debut of it will be October 7th. 7.30 p.m. at the Roxy Theater. Just come on, bring all your friends, family, shout it from the pylons, let everyone know. <laughs> it's only $5 a ticket. All proceeds go to help the friends at the Historical Museum. And then uh, speakers will, of course, be there. Right. And then a matinee showing for those that can't make it that evening will be October 11th, which is that following Sunday at 4 p.m. No speakers will be there, but it will still be held for the public, and I hope everyone can make it. Excellent. Great. Jesse, thanks for coming by. Of course. Thank you for having me. You know it. Um, stay with us, folks. Mark Thane is here from Missoula County Public Schools. He's the superintendent, and he knows what he wants you to know. So <laughs> we'll be right back after this. I'm a junior at Sentinel High School, and I need a smart school because I want to be able to study political science when I graduate. I want to be able to focus on learning and not waiting for slow technology. I want to be able to focus on learning, not sweating in August and freezing all winter long. MCPS is hosting community open houses in every school. Learn how that impacts students like me. Have the opportunity to provide input and ask questions. Get smart about our public schools. Let's visit a Smart Schools 2020 open house. Please visit www.mcpsmt.org. Sergeant Greg Gamis with the Missoula Police Department. I'd like to talk a little bit about something I see downtown routinely, and that is pedestrians crossing against the pedestrian heads. So I'd just like to explain what is actually legal. You cannot begin crossing in the crosswalk when it's either flashing and in the countdown or solid red. The only time it's legal to begin crossing in that crosswalk is when the white crossing sign is displayed. The, what the countdown is for and the only thing that that's there for is to tell you how much time you have to finish crossing the street, presuming that you started when it was legal to do so. That never left. Oh, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> 
It was a really good story about the background I'm sorry you of missed Alfred Chipolato, yeah. but we'll have to wait for another time. Mark Thane is here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak a little bit about the upcoming bond election. Yeah, this is That's excellent. Right. And we promise, like, we're not going to make Mark talk and talk. We're going to ask intelligent <laughs> Stand on a soapbox questions and about then, this right, issue. Right. One Perfect. of which is, could you tell the viewing public a little bit about the history of the bond request. A lot of people are like, wow, there's a lot of money being requested of voters in order to rejuvenate the schools. But how, how do the schools determine, for instance, what needed to be done? Actually, there were really three processes that have been completed to get us to today. During the 2008-2009 school year, uh, the school district had an opportunity to participate in a state-funded grant program that assessed the condition of all our facilities. And that initial grant study revealed uh, literally millions of dollars worth of deferred maintenance needs. And I'd make a distinction. It's uh, interesting when you walk in our buildings, they're well kept up. The floors are shiny and waxed. So I'm not talking about typical operations and maintenance. No, I'm they talking about look things. Beautiful. Right. Yeah. I'm talking about boilers, mm -hmm. heat distribution systems, roof structures, and seismic capabilities. But as you know, um, in 2009, when the study was completed, uh, the economy was such that we couldn't go before the voters and uh, make a request. So uh, that was the first uh, plank of the process. Then in the 2010 school year, we started what we called the 21st century model of education. And essentially, we had over 200 members of the community complete a visioning process to really address what it was that they intended their community schools to be and uh, how we might make that transition from traditional school as we knew it to a 21st century model of education. So uh, those two efforts then were brought together uh, in yet a third process. It's one that we've termed Smart Schools 2020. And we engaged over 300 members of the community, uh, teams representing each of our school facilities. So parents, students, staff members, community members to look at the deferred maintenance needs, to look at the degree to which the school's uh, physical plant aligned with our 21st century model of education, to try and develop an understanding of the technological needs of a 21st century education, and ultimately then to recommend to the school board uh, those enhancements that were required of the physical plant. Right, and this was not a quick process because I remember no. MCAT was requested yeah. to record meeting after meeting. I mean, we were kind of like, oh my goodness, but this was <laughs> over months and months mm -hmm. and hours and hours. Yes, and hours. very extensive process. In fact, uh, the documents from that study are all posted on the Missoula County Public Schools website. Uh, so if you're interested in digging into it, it's uh, www.mcpsmt.org. And there are over 1,600 pages of documents linked. Uh, it was a very comprehensive study of the needs, and ultimately recommendations were made to the board, and the school board had to cull those uh, recommendations down to what we now have represented before the voters. Right. And um, how are the voters going to participate? It's a mail-in ballot? That's correct. Uh, the election is technically November 3rd, but it's an all-mail ballot, so the ballots will be mailed on October 13th, so about two weeks away, uh, should arrive in people's mailboxes by about October 15th. Right. All ballots need to be returned by uh, November 3rd in order to be counted. Uh, if you're going to mail them, you'll likely want to mail them the week before, although there will be some drop-off locations on November 3rd itself. And it's a, it's a large amount, right? People have said, okay, this is, is it separated out? That I, did, I think that's true, but I, I'm not sure. That is true. There are actually two different issues. Uh, we're technically two different school districts. Right. Our kindergarten through eighth grade district serves essentially the city of Missoula proper. All nine elementary schools and three middle schools are located within the city limits. Uh, we also, though, serve uh, as a countywide high school district with the exception of Frenchtown. So those students that attend the independent K-8 through districts, the uh, Bonner, Clinton, Lolo, Target Range, Hellgate, DeSmet, Greeno, uh, Sealy, uh, all feed into our high school system. So those uh, voters would vote only on the high school initiative if your students attend one of the independent K-8 districts, and uh, the city proper will vote on the elementary requests. Right. And, um, 
and people don't need to know which category they fall into, they automatically be sent to them. Yeah. So they'll be sent they'll to get the, right the correct ballot. ballot. Right. Yes, that's true. Now, Missoula has, I, if I recall correctly, a pretty uh, impressive record of supporting its school district and yes. bond issues. Yes, the community has been very, very supportive. Uh, we have, of course, a unique situation with school funding where virtually every levy request or every increase to budget goes before the electorate, and mm -hmm. the Missoula electorate has been very supportive historically. But the, and the counterpart to that is that um, the school board and administration is really judicious in determining how much to ask for and not just um, sure. high in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> we believe we're being good uh, stewards of the public funds, and yeah. that is certainly one of our goals. Uh, we need to be responsive to the public. We recognize that the requests that are being made on this ballot are significant. Um, I would cite some examples, uh, though, in support of the board's decision to put these on the ballot. Uh, Lowell School is a prime example. Mm. Um, it's a 106-year-old facility that we continue to use. Uh, if you were to in enter the front doors of Lowell School, it's a split entry building, so it's not ADA accessible. Right. Um, the uh, people entering the building would have to ascend a set of stairs, turn left and go about 50 feet down a hallway before you get to the school office. Mm -hmm. And in the post Sandy Hook Columbine days, uh, that creates some security issues for us. Anyone could enter the building and be in classrooms in a matter of seconds without being uh, visually seen by anyone from the office. So we need to address uh, ADA requirements, we need to address deferred maintenance needs, and certainly safety and security. That's in addition to technology. Uh, we. Uh, have some significant needs with regard to technology in the district. There are incredible online resources, there are opportunities for blended instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, our students need to be able to access the courseware that students all around the country access and right now our technology infrastructure doesn't support that. So uh, all buildings would get significant upgrades for technology, safety and security in addition to the deferred maintenance. We also have some capacity issues. Since 2010 the elementary enrollment in our K-5 buildings has increased by about 420 students. Isn't that so awesome. it's significant and we had a, a demographic study completed as part of our process and we anticipate growth continuing for the foreseeable future, certainly through 2022. So these are the baby boomers' children. It's okay. actually the uh, echo, oh. echo yeah, boom. Yeah, it's the echo, yeah, echo, right. Because right. remember all of the, the trial the district went at the turn of the century yeah. when there was the downsizing and there were not enough students in that K through right. six period to justify having all the schools open. Mm -hmm. So now they're boomeranging back. I don't uh, think the district can uh, really true. control that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> although Missoula is in a fortunate position that our economy has continued to grow, although yeah. somewhat slowly, but certainly at a steady rate. And therefore our enrollments have continued to grow and the de demographic projections are for a continued steady uh, growth. That growth will hit our middle schools and our high schools shortly. Um, I would just illustrate another example of the need. Hellgate High School, of course, is uh, one of our older buildings. Hellgate served by two boilers, and last year one of the boilers, boiler number two, failed. And fortunately it was a mild winter. We were able to get through the, the year with a single boiler. But this summer we had to have all four corners of that boiler rewelded, seek recertification so that the boiler could be used. And I think that illustrates what we've done historically is uh, we have used resources for short-term fixes. We need long-term fixes. Mm -hmm. We need to replace aging uh, infrastructure. Uh, Hellgate's also, like many of our older buildings, heated with steam, and it's a very inefficient system. So the bond issue and the upgrades that are called for would also help improve energy efficiency in our district, which is important to us. So. Again, uh, there is a brochure reflecting the specific projects and the budgets for each of those projects relative to each of our buildings. And they're all posted on the website and people can look at the fine detail if they wish. Yeah, there, and then there'll be some, of course, that will want to know, you know. I'm sure. Um, Mark, can you tell people what they're expecting, what the district is asking, just in case some of the viewers don't know the the magnitude of the, the request. Certainly. So the kindergarten through eighth grade district, the elementary district, is making an $88 million request. Uh, if you have a home with a $200,000 assessed value, so not market value, but assessed value, the tax impact on that home would be approximately $12 a month, $144 a year. 
the high school district, again, is a larger tax base because it serves the entire county with the right. exception of Frenchtown. That request is a $70 million request. Again, on a home with a $200,000 assessed value, that would be approximately $6 a month or $72 a year. Wow. It's nicer when it's split up among the county, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. Are, are the, the two requests separate on the ballot or together? They are separate. Yes, because it's two different uh, districts, as you mentioned, right? Yes, and two different sets of voters, actually. Yeah, so. yeah. That's curious. Yes. Kim, can you think of anything in addition? I, I think, I mean, th this has been, as you said, a long time in the planning, um, and, and a request for kind of facilities upgrades hasn't come before the voters in quite some no. time. Actually, we're in a somewhat enviable position in that our elementary district has no bond indebtedness right now. So wow, I, I might make an that. analogy. <laughs> uh, if you as a homeowner had a 30-year mortgage yeah. and uh, invested over time to pay that off, you might find that at the end of that 30-year mortgage, uh, your house might need some investment. Maybe right. a new roof, new we carpet, some paint. We just had to put the new roof on. Yeah. There you go. Well, that's <laughs> where we find many of our buildings. Yeah. Uh, we do have a slight amount of bond indebtedness remaining on the high schools from some expansions, including some science labs that were added a number of years ago. But that was refunded uh, when interest rates went down. Uh, we were able to lower the tax impact on the public and refinance those bonds. Right. And, and so I, I heard you when you said some of this need, you know, somebody um, in the public, and, and I could quite sympathize them, they would say, oh, my goodness, this is like $158 million. Um, why were things let go so long? But I heard you say that there was a growing awareness of this need in 2009, right? When right. the housing market bubble right. really was darkened everyone's sense. Right. Yeah. Sure. Sure, and I think, again, uh, back to your comment about being good stewards of the public funds, uh, that was not a time that we felt we could go before the public with a request of the magnitude that's necessary yeah. just to address the deferred maintenance piece. Yeah, and then, and then in the meantime, this whole concept of smart schools and the need for technology, I know firsthand, you know, when the cable company changed the way people receive cable and they put in digital boxes, um, we heard from a lot of teachers that were unable to replace cable right. using Correct. digital because the digital infrastructure is so poor. Yeah. They would try to get their kids the same streamed information they got from the cable company and there was no business because yeah, a lot of things the are. internet was just you know, yeah. so uh, antiquated. I, I hear from teachers a lot about the frustrations sure. of Well, <laughs> and I can give you a good story about that. Uh, Chief Charlo Elementary is the newest building in our district, yeah. and I had the good fortune to be the principal when Chief Charlo opened 20 years ago this fall. Oh. And we were the first networked building in the district. We hired a retired uh, Navy network specialist to come in and pull cable and terminate connections. And every staff member had a dial-up internet connection. So we had our own <laughs> internal e email. And uh, you remember the days of the old AOL beeps and the motor yeah, sounds? Yeah, uh, yeah. Every staff member had that access. And if you were patient, you could load a web page. Right. Right. And that's our newest building. And again, none of our uh, buildings were also constructed with the idea not only of the internet, but the amount of electrical service that's oh, necessary sure. to run all the devices yeah. that we have. Right. And students today, in addition to their smartphones, have tablets or notebooks or iPads. Uh, they access information very differently than you and I did when mm -hmm. we went through school. And so mm -hmm. it's necessary to support engaging instruction that can stream video, that can have instant access to the wealth of information that's available right. through the internet. Well, and it's sort of well known here you know, that's cropping up in the national and global economy, the concept of the digital divide. Right. Those uh, particularly working class people that don't have access to the internet are mm -hmm. not familiar with all these new tools like the smartphone or the tablet, uh, synchronizing devices. They soon fall out of the right. economic conversation because it's moving so fast. And I mean, as we talk about job creation in yeah. Missoula, for instance, um, you know, part of that is an educated workforce that starts with our kids. You bet. And I would uh, make two points. The first being that uh, we want all our students to be college and career ready when they graduate. And employers as well as higher education demand that they have technological literacy, have the skills necessary to be successful in either environment. Um, the second thing that I would say, back to your point about economic development, um, as 
new employers look at Missoula as a potential uh, site for relocation. They want to know, number one, do we have potential to provide them with a workforce? But number two, if they're going to relocate to our community, right. What kind of school experience will their own children right. have? Sure. And are they willing to relocate their business to a community uh, right. that will serve their children well? So uh, I think that you can also look at this bond measure as an opportunity to expand some economic development potential in yeah. Missoula. Yeah. And, and the prejudice is out there, you know, about, <laughs> about Montana and whatnot. You sure. know, when right. I had my MRI done, and I brought it to the New York neurosurgeon. She turned to my sister and said, where'd they shoot these, in a barn? <laughs> <laughs> Just because she knew I had come from Montana. Montana. And then when I went to the technician, I said, are these any different than the ones she just ordered? He said, no, they're, they're the same quality. Right. Sure. So we have an uphill battle in Montana. In perception. To, yes, in perception right. to present yeah. to the nation, you know, a, a yeah. technologically fit education system. Perfect. Well, Mark, is there anything else people should know before they go to their mailbox? We make you talk I, too much. <laughs> no, actually, I appreciate it. You know, my intent is to simply get the word out. Yeah. Um, I think it would be a great disservice to the community if their questions were not answered and if they did not have access to all the necessary information to make an informed judgment. And really, that's what it's about. We're putting this before the community so the community can have a robust conversation, and ultimately, they'll pass judgment on our uh, bond request November 3rd. But uh, it would be a crime if we had an uninformed electorate or if we had low participation in the election. So we appreciate the opportunity to get the word out. We want everybody to do their homework, and uh, we want everybody to participate in the election. Right. That's the thing. No. Mail thing, in, fill out your ballot, yeah. mail it in. And if you yeah. haven't received it by October 15th, call the elections office and let them sort you out because it might just be that you forgot to vote in the last major moved, election or, or you moved yeah. two so. major things. Perfect. All right, Mark, thank you. Thank you, thank you for time. shepherding this, yeah. us through this process and good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to be right back. Brendan Mulls is warming up in the bullpen. <laughs> He's getting that bowl very warm. He's going to come out with it. Um, and it's about homeward and it's about first time home buying learning coming up uh, right after Scott shows you this. I'm Montana Hope. I am Montana Hope. I am Montana Hope. For the last 30 years, the Montana Hope Project has been granting wishes to Montana children who face life threatening illnesses. I'm Montana Hope. To make a donation and help their wishes come true, please visit MontanaHope.org. We are Montana Hope! Hi, my name is Scott Raff. My name is Noel McAvoy, and I'm one of the hosts of your hyper-local morning show, Wake Up Missoula. And I host this morning show called Wake Up Missoula. It's a hyper-local morning show on Missoula Community Access Television. Wake Up Missoula airs Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings at 8 a.m. on channel 189. You can find out more information by logging on to MCAT.org. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure we're on Google somewhere. We are all about Missoula, everything local. And you can also find us on YouTube. We post all our videos from our show. We air three days a week. It's a lot of fun. And if you would ever want to be on our show, you can contact us at 542MCAT. Sergeant Greg Amundsen with the Missoula Police Department. I'd like to talk a little bit about bicycles riding on the sidewalks in the city of Missoula, which we see a lot because Missoula is a very bike-friendly town. I would just like to let bicyclists know that they do have to yield to pedestrians on the sidewalk safely because they travel faster than a pedestrian, so they do have to do that in a safe manner. And then when you get to a crosswalk, you are actually required to slow your bicycle down to what would be called a pedestrian pace, and you cannot begin crossing until it's safe to do so. Oh, we're back. <laughs> oh my gosh, shocking news. <laughs> I'm telling a tale out of America. school is what happened to my house. <laughs> but, it, but that is not what it's about. It's about Brendan Moles. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Here from Homeward to talk about an overview. Yes. Okay. Of the organization, but more specifically about the services we, we offer. Yeah. Yeah. Homeward's been in existence for almost 21 years now and uh, nonprofit here in town. Originally got started as a part of WORD, Women's right. Opportunity Resource right. Development. And we got big enough on a, you know, grew out of our own shoes, so to speak, and moved on to our own. We are a developer and owner of local affordable housing. And I say local, I, I should have said 
statewide because we have residents and units throughout the state. I think we're approaching 20 total. Yeah. In Missoula itself, we have eight. We just broke new ground over in the uh, old sawmill district over by the ball Good field. Good for you. I That's drove great. by. It looks exciting. Oh. What is that going to be in the sawmill district? It's going to be a, a, for, uh, a income-based affordable rental units. Excellent. Healthy, safe rental units. Mm -hmm. Well, right by the ballpark, right by Curran's pool the, the that I pool? go to, right, right by the beautiful Silver and Lake Park. And the great park. paths now. Yeah. The path that goes yeah. right past my house. Very nice. Another <laughs> addition that's worth 10000 a unit. <laughs> right past my house. Uh, but, uh, so we have two aspects to the organization. One is the development side, which is the one, the, the organization, part of the organization that does building, construction, rental units. And then the other side is the program side, and that's the side I work for. Mm -hmm. We offer what we call a full continuum of services. We are one of three regional home ownership centers in the state of Montana, Missoula, Great Falls, and Billings being the three. And what we do is we offer education. We offer financial education and financial counseling. Then we hope from the financial as education aspect, they move on to the home buyer education, right. where it's, both of these classes are, are comprehensive nine-hour classes. And the home buyer education, then you go into pre-purchase counseling, which I offer. And we do post-purchase counseling, and we do foreclosure counseling. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we the do life the life cycle full, of homeowners. <laughs> there, there you go, exactly. Joe, okay. yes. So next week, we actually have a class coming up the Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the 6th, 7th, and 8th of October from 6 to 9 p.m. Each it's night. Each night. So you do <laughs> nine hours total, and you get a certificate at the end of the class. Some loan programs, if you are pursuing home ownership, and not everyone does. I mean, this is a class mm -hmm. to give them the, the basics and the building blocks to decide whether this is the right step for them. Right. Some people we, we see there are required to take the class because the type of loan product, product that they're qualifying for mm -hmm. requires them to have a home buyer education oh, and the certificate. Okay. Some are there just to, to learn the ABC, so to speak. Um, I see people that are ready to go right out the gate and some people two or three years down the road with the class in, in hand become successful homeowners because they've taken steps now to move up that ladder to become a homeowner. Yeah. Because it's, it's a huge process and, uh, and if you don't know how to start, it, it can seem so overwhelming. Yeah, that's Exactly true. right. And we have a, Missoula, as all of us know here, um, is a great community. Uh, that's why we live here. Right. Not only just the environment, but the, the, the people within the community and the professionals within the community. We couldn't do this class and be successful 17 years, I think, we've been offering the class. If it wasn't for the members and the professionals and experts in the community that come and help with the class. Oh. I facilitate the class. I teach a few segments of it. But we have a realtor come in. We have a real estate loan officer. We have a home inspector, a home insurance agent, a wow. title company. We have a credit counselor. So there's, there's all these folks that come in and volunteer their time and expertise to help folks decipher the That's whole terrific. scheme right. of things. Because there's so much, you know, people start throwing that stuff around, right? Yeah. A lot of eyes glaze over. It's like, I'm still not sure what a title a, person Yeah, that <laughs> title research or mortgage insurance right? versus a percentage down yeah. or debt to income ratio. Listen, this mean, guy's an all that he's stuff. A, he's, he's a homeowner. He's, yeah. Right. See, I've learned it the hard way, people. There's no need to go through the hell that I've gone through. You can go through this class go to and, and have it more organized. Right. Yeah, we, no. we offer the class once a month, and we offer typically uh, – Quarterly, we do an all-day Saturday class for those folks that can't make an evening class. Yeah. So every March, June, help me out here, September, mm. December, yep. we offer an all-day Saturday class. Mm. Nine hours all packed into that one, one day. day. Exactly. It's a long, and you talk about glaze. You know? Yeah, yeah that's got to be tough. Yeah. It's a long day. Better to do the three in a row. If I you think. can, but some folks aren't, no, don't have that a, availability. They work in the night shift or they just right. can't make it for right. three consecutive evenings. So October is three consecutive evenings, uh, 6 to 9 p.m. We offer snacks. We offer yeah. coffee, hot tea. <laughs> and you have different changing instructors, right? Yes. So it's yeah. not just like drone, drone, drone. Here comes this new personality with this new angle on what a home inspection right. you know, entails and what it might mean in the bargaining process. Exactly. And, so and where are the workshops held? We're in the in our new buildings, so to speak, new buildings. We're at the corner of Broadway and Russell in the Solstice building. Oh yeah. The Equinox and Sol Solstice mm -hmm. are two most recent buildings in in Missoula, and we are housed in the Solstice building. We have a beautiful conference area, 
holds up to 42 people. And wow. I will say, we average in the mid 30s every single month, yeah. which is wow. amazing. You think of diminishing, you know, supply and demand, and how, how do we keep doing it? But I think it's just an, an it's amazing organization, great group of people that come in, and people are always willing to take that class. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Americans are raised with, with you know, one of our bedrocks is a home is your best and biggest investment. That's right. And and so everyone, you know, hopes that or most people hope that they can can take part in that part of the American dream. And that's interesting and you say that, Kim, because you know, we go over right the first thing, first night, first actual hour, we go over the advantages, disadvantages and the steps. Not everyone's meant to be a homeowner. Yeah. And it is a lot of a process. And so it's good to go over that and talk about that and the investment and Joel mentioned mortgage insurance and how much of an investment you need to actually get into the home besides a down payment and paying your closing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, lack of freedom. I mean, you talk about buying that home. I mean, our, our parents probably, my folks lived in their house 30 years. Oh, so did mine. 40 yeah. for okay. my parents before they downsized. They're <laughs> yeah. in that house yeah. 40 years. But they say statistically you're in your home for five to seven years and then you're either... Moving on to a new position, can afford more, your family grows, outgrows it, or you downsize. Or you downsize, right. You yeah, know? like so my parents downsize. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're buying, and, and this is a market where I think in home ownership, it's a minimum five-year commitment. It, there's a bit of a lack of freedom. You know, you buy this house, you can't just expect to put out the sign and try to sell it. It's not it. the most liquid Exactly, asset. yeah. Yes. So when that's another good function of the class, or maybe for some, I don't know if you guys frown on people going just a one night to learn home ownership is not for them, but that they be, could become a renter knowing that's really what they wanted, knowing that it's not as if they didn't hit this mark. They, they They learned what the mark was, and they said, oh, no, that's definitely not for me. You know, I think you should really, to get the full benefit of the class, spend the full nine hours. But you're absolutely right, Joel. I mean, there is a slight cost. The only program that we service that we charge for is the home buyer education class. The yeah. financial fitness class, which is offered monthly as well in nine hours, is totally free and we incentivize it by giving them a twenty dollar gift card, whether oh, it's wow. to Fresh Market or Good Food Store or So you're local. making money going to that yeah, class. class. Well yeah, that's, that's great. incredible. Yeah. The home buyer <laughs> pre, the home buyer education class is the only service we charge for. All our counseling services are totally free. Foreclosure counselors I can spend up foreclosure clients I can spend upwards of twenty to forty hours sure. with the client. But the home buyer education class is twenty five dollars as an individual, forty dollars as a household. And it's non-refundable, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So you, <laughs> do you recommend that people uh, register ahead of time? Absolutely, Joel. Okay. The, class, the class fills up um, yeah. quite quickly. October, though, we have some room in October's class. November's class will be an all-day Saturday. Unfortunately, I will not be there to facilitate it. Oops. I know. I'm going to Southeast Asia. What? Wow. No kidding. Yeah, that's great. Close to a, about almost a month. So. Oh, my gosh. I, my, my peer at the office, Janine Lovell, will be teaching the class in November, facilitating class. Okay. And then I'll be back for December's class. Um, can you tell people the phone number? Because I'm afraid it was mushing in with your shirt. Every time I saw Scott <laughs> put it up. <laughs> It just because of the green, the, he has it in green. We're all matching Mushing. today. There we go, yeah. Oh, that's it. That's more clear. 532-4663. That's correct. Okay. And Joel, that's great eyesight. I just You're went to the eye doctor. Over there, yeah. <laughs> and the website is? Homeword, H-O-M-E-W-O-R-D dot org. Yep. And you can register for class online. All our classes uh, is registration online and payment online as well. Oh, but easy. the counseling services, you do not have to attend a class to receive counseling. Yeah, counseling is to totally to free. that a little. Like, yeah. like if people, I mean, sometimes it happens. People, you know, for whatever reason are in this foreclosure process and can be incredibly scary. So can you tell people how you you help them in that Absolutely, situation. Joel. What I, we ask them to do is complete an intake packet, which is available online at our um, website. Complete that packet, submit it to us with all the documentation we request, and we do ask for a lot of documentation because what we're doing is helping them put together an actual request to submit to their servicer. And we've been doing it for five years now, and we have the knowledge of what the servicer is expecting, so we prepare the clients to get us this documentation so we can assist them, and we help them completing the forms. Uh, we have no silver bullet at our office. Our, uh -huh. We don't control the decision made on the servicer, but we can educate the client in our best ability, in our opinion, of what we think is possible. Some clients, it's just financially not feasible anymore to retain their home. 
They're in a situation right. where there's been a death, a divorce, a reduction in hours of work, or a loss of job, and they just financially cannot afford it anymore. Yeah. So what we can do is help them make a plan to transition out of the house and see if there's any available options with their service or maybe to get some what we call cash for keys or some assistance to move out of the home. Okay. Give them see, some, some extra time. Some people may be so tripped out they're never going to be yeah. thinking of their stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And it is a process. It's a long process. Um, and it, it, you know, it happens to the best of us. So we ask that they just be patient. Get in touch with us early on in the process for themselves so that they're not coming to us at the you know the 23rd hour where they have a foreclosure right. sale in seven days and there's absolutely nothing not we can do for them at them at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So when they first feel that hit where they're not going to be able to make a payment is the best time to get a hold of us. And then we can start the process. In the state of Montana, we're a non-judicial state for most part. Most people have deeds of trust. We own property less than 40 acres, so we have a deed of trust, and that's a non-judicial action. So there's time. Typically, there can be upwards of four to probably seven months before the actual sale date from the f first missed payment. So there's a bit of time, but we really want to get them in the very beginning rather than towards the end. Sure. Yeah, sure. Because talk about a, a complicated, scary process. Yeah. Why would you not want help? Exactly. Right. And it's a free service. Free yeah. Because there's a lot of scams out there, sure, you know, that yeah. are telling them, we can help yeah. you and pay us $1,500, right. $2,000, and we will help you save your home. Don't do it. This is a free service. The Montana uh, uh, Attorney General's Office is a big supporter. When the, the big settlement with the five major servicers in the country, when the state got its pool of money, the AG's office was fantastic. Instead of putting it into the general fund, they decided, to, let's get it out to the people in the in the on the road, um, what's that expression? On the rocks? No. <laughs> Happy hour for Joel. Yeah. You know, feet on the ground, or you know, boots on the ground. Boots on the ground. You know, let's get it to those folks, the foreclosure counselors, and so the AG's yeah. office has really helped us out and fund mm. our counseling services. Oh, that's right. excellent too. All right. Well, thank you so much for waiting. Is there anything you want to add before we move on to Scott and the Saturday drop-in animation? No, just like <laughs> I hope to see everyone who's considering purchasing a home come by and take the home buyer education class. And again, free counseling, pre-purchase, and financial counseling. So take advantage of that. That's it's a great excellent. resource in our community. It really is. Five three two four six six three three. Homeword.org. Great. Right. Thank you Thank for you coming. Yeah, have Appreciate a great trip. It. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. come back with slides. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You do the travel <laughs> off. Oh, cool. I know. I know. I don't know what I meant by that. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back. And Scott's going to talk about this drop-in stop animation available for youngsters in the region beginning mid-October. We'll be right back. That wheel is so If you go by one of the many shows that you see this beautiful machine at, spend some time to talk to these guys because one of the things that you find out about this is you have to be pretty much much mechanical genius because you can't just go down to Napa and buy parts for a 1908 piece. Quite often if they need a part, they've got to manufacture it or somehow rebuild the old one. It takes an amazing amount. It's a labor of love to keep a machine like this going, and we're glad you guys do. Thank you for being here. With the Western Montana and...
<laughs> yeah. So that video that you just saw was um, uh, animation that I did during um, Animation Camp yeah, Week so Two. Because oh, this last summer so it, we did a um, two animation camps because it was so popular this summer. It's been getting more and more popular. More and more kids just fill up the camp, and then we just add an extra camp for that. Oh, right. Another week for the animation camp. Yeah, that's so true. Um, it's, it's, we came up with the idea right. of ooh, having ooh, a okay. Saturday drop in. That you know, right. just Fun. having kids come in from like 1 oh, to 3 on right. Saturday, starting October 17th, and we just do animation for two hours. And is it going to be every Saturday oh, through the rest starting, of the fall? Starting on the 17th, every okay. Saturday. I think we'll probably take um, three or four weeks off from the end of December, early January. Sure. That kind sure. of area but we're going to do it during like well, the school year like, yeah. because you know as soon as the like weather gets this? cold Number kids two. you know right you know they do That's go outside and play in the snow and stuff uh, like that but it's nice day. for some See, people to two. go inside and maybe do something creative in yeah. the impact well, yeah. cave <laughs> and especially you know for kids that got inspired uh, during the summer camps can jumps. you just oh. describe a little bit yeah. some of the skills that yeah. kids learn well they learn some stop animation stuff so um it also teaches a lot of patience. Yeah, because that's painstaking. <laughs> because you have to um, take a picture, mm -hmm. and then you move the item, yes. then you take another picture, yeah. then you take another picture, I mean, really <laughs> and then you take another picture. <laughs> and apparently this, like, without seeing my hand, this thing would move by itself and just right. kind of coast on it. That's the idea behind stop animation. Oh, but also, I really do want to teach, because some of that, the video that I just showed you wasn't stop animation. No. It was a mixture of Adobe Photoshop that we have and a mixture of Final Cut Pro. I mean, I just used video and a, a video editing software and a uh, picture editing software of Photoshop. And I just basically made a character. It was cute. It, was, it looked a little like South Park. It was adorable. Yeah. <laughs> can we show that, Joel? Joel, can you show it? No, he's busy yeah, chatting. Yeah, because then I can, I can actually talk about it uh, just a just, little bit, just kind of show you the right. process about, you know, it's under Scary Mansion. Okay. Go. While we're waiting for Joel. Yes. There we go. Here it is. So as you can see, um, I, I made the mouth move, and I added some, um, you know, voiceover and whatnot. But, you, you know, I'm not going to have any, like, I, I, there's no sound right now. But, right. Um, Oh. Yeah, see, there's a ghost, scary mansion. I just use a generic <laughs> picture of a, like a nice mansion, scoot, sp you know, scary mm -hmm. um, living room. And then I just um, basically separated the mouth, and then I basically moved the mouth by using keyframes. Oh, no, he's got a straw? Yep. Oh, this is so much fun. I want to learn how to do this. Yeah. This is great. Now, Scott, is there a fee? Involved? I believe it's about $5 for a drop in fee. So just a little bit to. to mm -hmm. Keep the facility open. Yes. And stuff. Yeah. Keep the lights on in here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I think it's a, um, yeah, it's, I think it's great. And I think the kids will get a kick, kick out of it. I'm sure. And what are the ages that are appropriate to come? Um, I guess like kids, like as long as they're, I want to say under 16 and under. Just like a general, between the ages of like 8 and 16. Okay. That would be okay. a good general you can age. And then we can, the, then we can separate them. It's going to be me and Noel going to be working with them. Okay. So it's at MCAT. And yes. the address here is? Um, uh, 500 North Higgins, 500 Suite 105. Right. Uh, is, that a, uh, is that like a trick question? Or is this <laughs> I like just a, wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, it's beginning 1 to 3 p.m., yes. beginning October 17th. Saturday, October So it's 17th. the weekend after Do It in 72. Okay, okay, okay great. Like what a fun thing for kids to do. Mm -hmm. And talk about learning a skill that might help you out, no. you know, in the this 21st century. The this could be oh. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we're out of time. Are we out of time? And okay. I'd like to say goodbye for Joel, who's in the control booth, and I'm Kim Anderson, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Missoula Live.